Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nobue, and uh, it's an honor to be here in uh, Tokyo with uh, Professor Hamada, uh, who, as we all know, is uh, an advisor to uh, uh, Mr. Abe and the uh, Japanese government. Um, in answer to your question, Japanese success in the 21st century, it, it begs the question of what uh, the Japanese mean by success. How will success be defined for Japan in the 21st century? Uh, those of us in business and economics tend to think of success being defined uh, in those terms. Uh, but of course, success can be defined in terms of uh, uh, quality of life and uh, uh, the happiness of citizens. It can be defined in terms of uh, security and uh, uh, global prominence. It can be defined in many ways. But let me just start with uh, the areas that I know a little bit about, uh, the economics and business arenas. Um, I was very encouraged by the um, election of uh, Prime Minister Abe, and I particularly appreciated his ability to encapsulate for Japanese people, but also for the global community, the three arrows of uh, Abe-nomics. Um, often those of us in the economics arena uh, find it very difficult to articulate uh, economic issues in ways that ordinary citizens can understand. And so I think his approach to uh, singling out these three particular thrusts of his policy, were, were, that was very, very intelligent. But at the same time, of course, it means that it's very easy to pick apart uh, whether or not uh, the government has succeeded in delivering against its objectives on each of these three issues. And I think we all know that there is perhaps one of the three arrows that has not been uh, fully uh, achieved at this point. Uh, and I'm sure Professor Hamada will have some comments uh, about that. Um, but I think more broadly, uh, there are two big problems that um, Japan faces. Um, one is the demography of the population, the aging of the population. It's very difficult to achieve growth when your population is not growing. And especially when you are dealing with an aging population, the fact of the matter is that older people don't spend as freely and don't spend as much on things, uh, on goods and services, as younger people do. Uh, they tend to uh, hoard cash, and even if the government support system in social services and health care is strong, uh, and well appreciated, nevertheless that still doesn't necessarily give them the assurance or the incentive to go out and spend uh, their money uh, on goods and services. I think a second problem in Japan is that where you don't have a growing population, you don't have so much pressure on the infrastructure. Now of course Japan is a relatively small country uh, geographically relative to its uh, total population. Um, and there is already a wonderfully um, well-developed infrastructure in Japan. Uh, all of us in America are very envious, of course, of the high-speed Japanese trains uh, and so forth that we are all um, very pleased to take when we are on our way to and from Osaka and so on. The thing is that there aren't so many enormously big and important infrastructure projects of a traditional nature uh, left in Japan for investment to take place in. Where there are opportunities, though, is in the area of telecoms and uh, other, other, non other elements of infrastructure that are not what we traditionally think of in terms of bridges and roads and so forth but dealing with the communications infrastructure uh, which can improve the productivity of Japanese citizens and the Japanese economy. And of course there's tremendous opportunity for additional innovation in those areas. But I think my point here is that it's easy to say to the government of Japan, please increase consumption, please increase investment, but we must understand the structural, uh, the structural challenges of the Japanese economy 
I'm sure there are many smart people in Japan who know exactly what should be done, but the structural elements of the economy sometimes get in the way of a quick result. Now, another key challenge in Japan coming to, to the business context, another key challenge in Japan is, in my opinion, the relative uh, strength or weakness of uh, Japanese business. I remember in the 1980s that we in America were uh, very attentive to uh, the success of the Japanese manufacturing system and uh, to all of the wonderful innovations that uh, Toyota and many other companies created in manufacturing processes. In fact, many people in Western Europe and the United States were quite afraid of Japan at that time and worked very hard to adopt those excellent uh, practices uh, in our own industries. What I see since that time is um, a lack of uh, continuous innovation on the part of uh, Japanese business. Um, of course, one cannot detract from the, the great uh, innovations of the 80s um, and the 70s in terms of manufacturing. But what about the 90s and the 2000s? Uh, we came to expect a lot from Japan in terms of business process innovation and also technical innovation. But we have not necessarily been as excited in the last 20 years as we were in the 20 years beforehand. And I feel very sad about that because um, I, like many other people in the United States, uh, love Japan, love coming to Japan, and hope uh, to um, enjoy many things uh, that are invented uh, in Japan. Um, but I wonder why we have not seen so much inventiveness uh, in the last 20 years. And it's almost as though there is a, a, a vicious cycle here. And perhaps I make a, a slightly um, embarrassing uh, comment. I hope uh, no one will be offended. But I feel as though uh, Japan and Japanese people are very conscious of the fact that they have not done so well in the last 20 years. And that they are sometimes embarrassed by this and actually become more inward looking, become more introverted and less willing to go out into the world and explore um, uh, the opportunities that exist internationally. Of course there are some great companies like, uh, like Toyota and the other uh, leading car companies like Honda that are doing still an exceptional job to represent uh, the image and um, innovativeness of Japan around the world. Um, but I looked recently at the latest list of the 100 most valuable brands in the world in 2015. And to my surprise, for the third largest economy in the world, there are only seven Japanese brands on this list out of the 100 total brands. There are, I think, 55 American brands on this list. Uh, there are also a few Chinese brands as well uh, that have now come forward. But I think uh, when I look at the, the rankings of the companies on this list, most of those companies are slipping from one year to the next in the rankings. Toyota still remains the strongest Japanese brand internationally. It's ranked uh, number seven most valuable brand. But five of the top seven brands are car brands, and the other two are Sony and Canon uh, that have both slipped remarkably badly uh, in the last uh, ten years. And so the image of Japanese business internationally is really all concentrated around its success in the automobile sector. And I just want to make this point to Japanese people because we always talk in business and economics about the importance and value of diversification. Um, but if the Japanese image is very much uh, a function of what happens in the automobile industry, um, given the potential technical advances in uh, electrical and other non-carbon fuel based uh, automobiles, 
there could be disruptive technologies that come into play that could upset the Japanese leadership uh, in that industry on which it is now so dependent for export earnings and uh, for its international image. The last point I would like to make, if, if you will permit me, uh, is on the issue of uh, corporate governance. Um, I am really quite disappointed, I have to say, with uh, the lack of progress in this area in, uh, in Japan. Um, I think uh, many Japanese people whom I meet with are just uh, wonderful, outstanding business people who have the ability and the competence to be very strong on the international stage. And um, they, they should not be afraid of having open, transparent, and uh, uh, very well structured corporate governance with a much higher proportion of independent directors uh, in the boardrooms of uh, Japanese companies. Um, it is not ever going to be enough in the 21st century for any Japanese company uh, to rely solely on the Japanese domestic market for growth. Uh, every Japanese company is going to have to be sensitive to uh, embracing the international challenges that uh, international markets offer. And one way that's very important to do that successfully is to have a diversity of opinion in the boardroom and to have uh, international perspectives, not just domestic perspectives, governing Japanese corporations. So I really hope that some of the uh, recent unfortunate uh, public, uh, public scandals uh, around uh, some Japanese companies have the effect of uh, galvanizing uh, more Japanese business leaders to understand the importance of them going out of Japan and um, understanding international consumers, but also in their boardroom deliberations embracing international points of view uh, from independent directors who are not uh, part of the uh, Japanese uh, traditional uh, insider group. So perhaps I have uh, uh, made enough introductory comments, I hope, for uh, uh, Professor Hamada to pick up on some of these points, and I, I very look very much look forward to hearing his uh, very thoughtful opinions.